Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, so we are um, going to start uh, next year lecture seven today. It's good to talk to audience. So um, as, as I promised, now the, 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 the goal today is, uh, I mean, maybe it will take two lectures. I'm not sure, definitely, I don't think we can finish it today. But, but our immediate goal is to prove that uh, if we have a, uh, so the goal is this, to show uh, an elliptic operator, P, um, say P from, let's say, infinity of E. To the infinity of f, uh, defines. In fact, I should say is um, a Fredholm operator. Um, so I should say over a compact manifold. This is very important. Finds a thread on uh, operator. So in a kind of uh, naive way, actually, which is correct, even in this case, uh, I mean, this has many different uh, versions. But so for now, I can just say that e.g. i.e. I should say e.g. e.g. Uh, dimension of kernel of p and dimension of co-kernel of p are both finite. So in particular, then this P uh, has an index, um, which we want to compute eventually, but uh, we have to know that uh, this is uh, the case. So the conditions are elliptic. Um, of course, differential operator, these things we know, we have seen many examples, but over compact is very important. Um, before getting, uh, into the idea of proof, let me give you an example uh, showing that actually why over non-compact manifolds. So this is not uh, true. Just there are many, many examples. So uh, this example you should keep in mind. In this case, is this okay? Yeah. The line is okay. Yeah. I guess. I guess. So okay. example. I can just say you can take b over some non-compact manifold which has let's say h one. Sorry, yeah. so, so you can take D, the differential operator, over some non compact manifold that says H1 as infinite. Uh, but that's not elliptic. Uh, oh, you, want, you didn't want elliptic complex already. Oh, no, no. Uh, for elliptic complexes, there is another version of this which we follows from this. But I just want an elliptic object. Okay. So the question is, can you give an example of an elliptic operator over a non-compact manifold such that uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not. Uh, Are there topless operators? A topless is not a differential operator. Topless operator is not a differential operator. So we are looking for a differential operator now. Okay, so what about this example? So let's take Laplace here. Uh, D2 dx2 plus D2 dy2 uh, going from C infinity of R2 and C, for example, 
to itself, right? So in this case, M is R2. And of course, uh, E and F are just uh, trivial rank one bundles over R2, right? R2 cross C. So trivial rank one bundles over C. Okay. And this is, uh, we computed the uh, symbol of this, right? Symbol of uh, delta is uh, is an C. We computed to be minus uh, C one squared minus C two squared, which is normal C squared. So this is different from zero if C is different from zero. Right? So we checked it uh, several times already. I guess that this is elliptic. So the plus n is elliptic. Now let's look at the kernel of Laplacian. So what is, what is the kernel in this case? Uh, well, kernel of Laplacians are exactly harmonic functions on R2, right? So kernel of uh, Laplacian is harmonic functions R2. And I say this is infinite dimensional. The reason for this, of course, is that I can take any uh, entire function in the plane and I take the real part or imaginary part of that entire function. These are all harmonic functions and the set of entire functions uh, is vast. It's infinite dimension. So this is uh, infinite dimension, right? So dimensional kernel of Laplacian is infinite. Uh, well, I mean kernel, so e.g. real part of f F entire. Entire means holomorphic function with infinite radius of conversion. So it's defined all over C, right? So take its real part, and this is obviously harmonic. F entire is harmonic. So, and in fact, if you go to higher dimensions, uh, Laplacian in all those higher dimensions, uh, uh, again, is, is, is elliptic, but its kernel is definitely infinite dimension. Do you know what's the dimension of the kernel of Laplacian on the, on, on the line? I'm just giving you some quick questions, so just to uh, awaken you. So you want the functions whose second derivative is zero. So that's important. No. <laughs> so so just a uh, note. I mean, this is a kind of fun note. Uh, it's nothing uh, serious. Uh, dimension of uh, kernel of delta on R two because a um, Kernel of Laplacian, again, uh, yeah, exactly. A second derivative should be zero, so this is the set of all functions, linear functions, basically, right? So this is Ax plus B, A and B belonging to C or whatever. So on the line, uh, you cannot use Laplacian to give uh, counterexamples like that, um, but you can give other examples. In the line. Okay. So, uh, but uh, I suppose I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> but if you go to dimension two and above, uh, you're going to construct many examples. Okay, so, um, so this is kind of uh, should convince you that compactness plays a big role in all the arguments uh, that uh, eventually we're going to provide for the group. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, so now uh, let me erase this and then um, um, now there is one issue uh, that we have to settle. So the issue is that um, 
that's the first issue actually is that a differential operator like that does not define a bounded operator in L2 norms. So the first issue is this. A differential operator. So let me write the O. Does not define. Um, so I would say is not, uh, so, so let me put it like this, is not bounded in L2 norms. So let me give you an example. This example will convince you that this uh, statement is correct. So here's an example, consider the operator P equal to i d d x from c infinity of uh, s1 and c uh, to itself okay so again in this case m is compact of course is s1 and e is equal to f is equal to again the trivial uh, line bundle over s1 okay um now uh, this is not uh, so we can think of IDDX now as going from distance subspace from C infinity of the swan, which is dense inside L2 of the swan, to L2 of the swan. Just the function goes on. It's dense, it's densely defined operator, which is differential operator, you know, L2 of the swan. So it makes sense to ask if this is bounded in L2 norms now or not, right? Uh, but now notice uh, there is this uh, functions e n x equal to e to the 2 pi i n x, for example, right? I n belonging to z. Or maybe I just, well, that's okay. I, I just put i n x, that's okay. If you, if you, don't, if you don't mind. Uh, so, uh, if you look at uh, these functions, uh, they have, uh, they are all bounded, they, they are all inside the unit uh, ball, right? Now, then you just notice that the norm of the n is less than equal to, well, it depends on what kind of uh, measure you use here, so normalized hard measure or something similar. In any case, this is less than equal to 1, for example, or n, doesn't matter for all n, right? So this is a sequence of functions inside the unit ball. Uh, if you hit this with uh, the operator, see what happens. If you look at i, d dx of the n, you get uh, n e to the i and x. But what is normal of these guys? is uh, n, and this goes to infinity. Well, it's absolute value of n, as n goes to infinity. So this cannot be a bounded operator in L2 norm. So this, this should convince you that this is definitely not a bounded. But uh, we love uh, bounded operators. I mean, the, the, the Fred Holm theory that we developed was uh, really for bounded linear operators between Hilbert spaces, right? So to use, to take advantage of that theory, the abstract Fred Holm uh, theory, we have to construct some Hilbert spaces uh, for which this P actually is uh, a bounded operator. And these are Sobolev spaces. So by introducing Sobolev spaces, we can um, turn a differential operator into bounded operators at the cost of introducing new norms, and then the norm here and norm there will be different. But that's okay, because it's still different spaces. That's, that's, that's the point of sort of theory, right? So uh, now let me tell you how we, we, we are going to do uh, sort of theory. There is essentially one way, that is uh, using Fourier theory.
So let me quickly recall uh, some basic uh, Fourier <coughs> transform. Fourier transform. So um, my notation is going to be this. So let's fix a Lebesgue measure first of all on our end. Uh, so the convention dx is, I believe, um, 2 pi to the power minus n over 2 dx1. There are different ways of uh, taking the normalization constant for Fourier, uh, Fourier transform. There are three ways, at least. Uh, each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. This is the one that Gilkey is using, and I, I follow Gilkey in this. So this is pretty good, actually. It is symmetric, because if you apply the inverse Fourier transform, you're not going to get anything. Okay, so that's a good thing. So that's our, our when I write the X, I mean, this, uh, this, this, is, the, uh, this is the standard, uh, of course, uh, volume four, and this is the normalization constant. This is my load like measure. Now I need this spaces of Rn, uh, Schwartz functions. Uh, Schwartz doesn't have it. Believe not. Schwartz functions on Rn. So this is the set of all functions f from Rn to C, such that f is a C infinity and is a rapid decay together with all its derivatives. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, so this rapidly goes to zero at infinity. All derivatives of f also go rapidly to zero at, at infinity. By rapidly going to zero at infinity, I mean they decay faster than inverse of any polynomial. That's, uh, that's it. So let me write down maybe a formal uh, statement uh, for this. Um, so for any i e, for any multi index. I and any A belonging to N, natural numbers, uh, there exists a constant C uh, and K, C K I, such that absolute value of E i f. Uh, yes, this is less than or equal to uh, C i k times one plus absolute value x to the power minus k. So I should say i e for any f belonging to S of R n and for any multi index i and any index k. There exists a constant CIK such that this is true. Maybe I should put X here also. So this is exactly the idea of rapid decay, right? That infinity decays faster than K power of inverse K power of any or something. Okay. So this is clear. Uh, so examples of this, of course, Gaussians. Um, keep this in mind, P of X times e to the minus uh, norm of x squared, etc. You can uh, cook up a lot of examples using Gaussians. You can put uh, even more negative powers of degree four and six, things like that over there. You can take linear combinations of such things. So you have access to a lot of examples. So another class of examples is uh, 
uh, compact support function. They are just zero after some compact support. And C infinity of C of Rn inside um, uh, S of R. So this is my notation for compact support smooth functions. Uh, so they are uh, clearly there. So that's that's the space shorts uh, class function that's very important for Fourier theory. Okay, so now uh, what we are going to do, well, let me define the Fourier transform uh, F F goes from Schwartz Schwartz so uh, f of f at x c is also denoted by f hat. So uh, two notations for free transform f, capital F, or f hat of c by definition is equal to integral exponential of minus i x dot c uh, f of x. Yes, of course. I mean, I don't write uh, integration over something, but this is really over Rn. Let me write it once at least, right? So this is the dot product of these two vectors in Rn, and this is, I mean, this thing obviously is defined because of rapid decay condition, and uh, it's actually L1 condition even is enough, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, and the result is, is, a, is Obviously, a smooth functioning C and also rapid decay, you can easily check all these things because of this uh, um, Schwarz class property. Okay, so this is nice. Um, okay, so this is for the transform of a function. Uh, just a comment it's better to think of, in fact, uh, uh, Fourier transform as a function of the dual space of Rn. If you want to think properly, really properly about this, or functorially, it's better to think of think of it as, as, as a function on the, on, on the dual of the group. But that's okay now because Rn we can just identify it as dual using uh, standard inner product. So there won't be we are not running huge risk of confusion if we just take Rn star to be Rn, but over general abelian groups, you have to be careful. The Fourier transform is a function on the dual group, uh, uh, not on, on, on the group itself. Anyhow, so that's uh, one thing. Now, some properties of this that's very important. Uh, let me recall these properties. Um, the most important property is. Uh, And we need it actually, we're going to use it, properties of uh, Fourier transform. Property one uh, is that this preserves uh, L2 inner products on both sides. So is that L hat, G hat, this is L2 in our product is equal to F G. This is really Fraunhofer's formula. Uh, this is a very important property. Let me uh, just need a quick switch off. Yes, uh, in particular. Uh, norm of uh, the function, L2 norm of the function, and L2 norm of the Fourier transform are the same. Right? Uh, norm of 
So it, 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 it just means that this property really, the Blanchard uh, formula means that F uh, from S of Rm, which is inside L2 of Rm, you see this is dense, um, going to L2 of Rm, this Fourier transform has a um, unique uh, bounded extension to L2, as a unique uh, continuous extension to uh, an isometry. Um, F again. So this isometry exists. Uh, just a kind of fun fact to think about is that although this exists, but there is no formula for this that works for all L2 functions. So that's kind of funny because uh, we have a formula working on Schwarz function, and this formula actually works on on all L1 functions, on all L1 functions. But there are functions in L2 which are not in L1, right? So, um, and vice versa, there are functions in L1 which are not in L2. But anyhow, for L1 functions, this formula is also, also correct. But there is no universal formula, as far as I know, to, that works for all L2 functions. Because you have to get into this uh, business of abstracting extension of operators. Anyhow, so that's, uh, but we use that. Um, uh, okay, so, um, so property two is that if you um, do convolution product on the left-hand side and take Fourier transform, it's like you take Fourier transform and multiply. So F star G is the convolution product integral of F of X minus uh, Y, G of Y, dy over Rn, right? This is convolution product. Okay, so um, it just turns uh, convolution product on the left hand side to usual pointwise multiplication on the right hand side. That's, uh, that's another uh, beautiful property of this uh, Fourier transform. And the third one is uh, Fourier inversion formula. So what does it say? It just says that uh, you can recover your function from its Fourier transform by the same formula, the same formula except for the change in sine of C. So it just says that I can actually use what they have written here is that um, f of x is equal to this one, and then I put it. So this is, uh, you can recover f from its, uh, yeah, this is the three version. So what does this mean? It just means that If you go back and forth using uh, Fourier, F squared is not identity, but is this uh, reflection operator R. The reflection operator R is uh, just uh, R, R acts like this, R, F, and X is equal to F of minus X, right? And uh, from here also you conclude that F four is equal to identity. So the fourth power of Fourier is one. Its second power is uh, 
is this reflection operator. Um, Uh, we need some other uh, properties. Uh, that's the behavior with respect to uh, that's um, that's the behavior of uh, differentiation and multiplication uh, under Fourier transform, and these are extremely useful properties. So let me write it here. So uh, what if you differentiate uh, all the times a function like uh, uh, maybe f and fully transform it and you want to know its value of c. This is you can fully transform the function and then you can multiply by uh, c to the power of alpha. alpha. So this is C. So let me introduce this. Uh, so this D alpha is really like uh, 1 over I, D alpha 1, DX1 alpha 1. Um, okay, so I should say DDX1 alpha 1, 1 over I, uh, DDX2, Alpha two, uh, one over i, uh, d d x n, alpha n, and what we have uh, the alpha equal to alpha one, alpha two, alpha n is a multi-index. One thing. <clears throat> so. Um, well, why do I uh, put this outside? That's a stupid. Okay, that's not the intention. Sorry. And also, c to the power alpha is really polynomial c1 alpha 1, c2 alpha 2, cn alpha. Okay. So, this is this uh, new differential which uh, takes care of this 1 over i business, which we always have to carry with us. So, now it's taken. Built into, into the notation. So if you differentiate the function, basically uh, it turns, uh, it's fully transform turns multiplication by this polynomial C alpha. That's extremely useful, I think. I mean, that's one of the raison d'etre for, uh, for uh, Fourier transform. And another property is that, uh, uh, so this was, I think, property four. So five is uh, that, what if you just multiply by a polynomial, your function, and then for your transform, and then evaluate that like C of it. So this is, uh, uh, it turns out this is, you, you can fully transform and then uh, differentiate alpha one times alpha. So this is basically D alpha, C hat acting on C. Now, in all these statements, uh, it's safe to take F, for example, Schwarz class function. So I'm just implicitly assuming it belongs to Schwarz class, but you can extend these things uh, to larger classes of functions. But for example, for Schwarz class function, this is a statement. I mean, this is the whole point. Uh, Fourier transform turns multiplication into differentiation, differentiation into multiplication, turns convolution into product, and is an, is an isometry. All right. So that's a, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, this is a function of C. It means that I'm using the alpha partial derivatives with respect to C, right here. Here is with respect to X. Here is with respect to this momentum variable C, the dual variable. Okay. Okay, so we have now um, this, uh, everything that we needed to know about uh, Fourier transform to define solar space.
Okay, so let's go go on. So um, so let me introduce this sort of the space H S. Okay, so um, for S belonging to R. Define the norm uh, my notation I believe is um, any f belonging to s of r n uh, this norm uh, yes norm s it's my notation s square is equal to integral absolute value of f hat of uh, c squared times one plus c squared yes to the power of s dc over r okay so what we are doing uh, here uh, we uh, in order to define these norms and your functions you fully transform and in, in the do, in, in, after you put it on, so you multiply by this uh, particular function because s need not be uh, integer, so this is not be a polynomial anymore. This is just a function, and it could be negative also. S could be negative, it could be anything, any real number. And then you just uh, take this, uh, you define this as your norm. In fact, this is a, this comes from an inner product. Uh, in fact, so let me just, you, you can take inner product of f and g to be, you know, you put here, but this is, everything is nice and squared up. In fact, it is an inner product. So I should say it comes from an inner product, as you can easily see. So that's uh, one thing to notice. Uh, okay, so we have this space S of R, Rn, and uh, norm S. So this is a pre Hilbert space because there's an inner product and it's, it's a pre Hilbert space, right? It is a pre Hilbert space. So once you complete it, you're going to get a Hilbert space. Uh, complete it. And you get the Hilbert space. Uh, uh, HS. VS, I put it down. No, not HS. And this is the S solar of space of on Rn. So this is the S of functions on our end or something. So we have this uh, Hilbert space for any real number. So we have we have defined all this scale of Hilbert spaces. Right. Any question before I move on? Okay, so um, then, uh, uh, so let's look at some examples of this. Uh, first of all, what, what if S is equal to zero? If S is equal to zero, then this norm is equal to L2 norm of F by Plancherel, right? Um, by Plancherel. Uh, norm uh, solo of, of uh, zero solo of norm is equal to uh, the L2 norm, right? So this is space, uh, we can think of it as uh, L2 uh, of Rn. In fact, 
if you want to think about it like that, we have to use Fourier transfer to come back to functions on Rn, and then that's your just. Uh, so, it, so this is an important observation that we always think of H zero of Rn as L two of R. So. Now, uh, one thing uh, that's uh, clear, if you note that if S1 is less than S2, uh, my thing here, S1 less than S2, um, and then uh, norm F uh, S1, yeah, I should use this. Uh, norm S1 is less than equal to norm F S2, right? For any uh, Schwarz class functions. I mean, uh, look at these things. This uh, polynomial is uh, increasing in S, so just the value increasing in S1. Okay, so this immediately shows that. The natural map, so this implies that the identity map from uh, Schwartz Rn and norm uh, S2, uh, oh, sorry, norm S2, I'm writing, okay, S2 to Schwartz Rn. And norm S1 is it, it is bounded. Right? It's, 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 a con, it's a contraction. Right? It's bounded. And because this guy is dense in the sober of the space, so you get a unique extension to uh, sober of the space. Right? So there exists a unique extension. Unique extension. The map. This map uh, now goes from uh, uh, sober of space uh, H S2 to H S1. So remember S1 is less than S2. So, uh, in particular, if S is positive, question? Uh, because uh, I'm using, uh, it goes from S2 to S1 here. Oh, sorry, yeah. S2 to S1. Yeah, yeah, because it's not in a round, because of the norms. Uh, <laughs> In the target that is less than should be less than for continuity. Yeah. So, anyway. right. so in particular, uh, for S positive, well, then, uh, then, 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 uh, what we get? Then uh, we get that. Uh, um, uh, I should get that this uh, H S. Of Rn is in fact inside H0 of Rn by this statement. But H0 of Rn is L2 of Rn, right? L2 of Rn. So we can think of members of uh, the sober of the space for S positive as functions, as L2 functions. So these are L2 functions with some properties that we still don't know, but these are still uh, at least L2 functions. That's important to, 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 to bear in mind. These are L2 functions with some extra properties that we haven't uncovered uh, yet, but we will say something more about the extra property part. But uh, if you go to the negative scale, then you get out of L2 and you, you have to deal, you get things like each other, like distributions and you get all kinds of strange, uh, you know, creatures there, but uh, 
so far. I mean, okay, so that's that's good for now. We just so uh, any questions or you could have played the same game with LP also. Yes, uh, you can define uh, this is uh, L two subgroup of spaces. You can do LP subgroup of spaces. Also, you can you can do LP local subgroup of spaces. There are all these uh, functional spaces. But for index theory so far, I don't think these are needed. So this is this is the good news that this much is enough for us. And it's not clear that C infinity belongs to this combination. No, I mean, in fact, uh, there's no reason that that be uh, for general uh, for general um, things. But uh, in fact, in fact, we'll we'll prove something about C infinity of rapid decay, something like that. We can. I mean, of course, I mean Schwartz functions are there, but what smooth functions beyond beyond Schwartz functions are there? So we're going to unveil some some properties. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so I think, uh, so let me make some comments about this sort of space. So the idea is that S measures regularity. It's, it's, it's an order of differentiability, but it's a different way of measuring differentiability. It's, it's a more subtle notion of differentiability. So the, the, it's always good to know, to have some intuitive idea. So let me, Um, so, in a sense, uh, to be made precise, uh, S in HS of N measures uh, the degree of a differentiability of uh, elements and in fact I can say a little more in fact I can say roughly these are functions who, which are which have s which are s times differentiable and the s derivative is l2 that's that's the philosophy um, i e these are functions i mean this is a rough, a rough statement okay so uh, roughly again these are functions um, which are S times differentiable with S derivative in L2. I mean, this is a statement we made precise soon, so this is. Okay, so so then, okay, so the first uh, interesting lemma here is uh, Sobolov's lemma that in fact uh, relates uh, these functions to differentiability if s is large enough so this is uh, lemma i have a question uh, oh yes yes sir uh, does it make sense to ask what is the intersection of all these subgroup spaces mm -hmm. um yes they, they are in fact uh, Interlace. I mean, interlace is not. Uh, they, they are kind of. Uh, they form a chain. In fact, yeah. So. They form a chain. Uh, so this is L two, and it decreases as S grows to infinity, goes to plus infinity, and this this increases as uh, S goes to minus infinity. So the chain is in reverse order. It's a kind of decreasing chain, if you want. 
So, yeah. so you can think of intersection of all HS, and this will be exactly a smooth functions that are. Uh, yeah. So we'll 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 drive it uh, right now. Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. Good. So this is the solar flamma. Um, so I can say the following, let S bigger than N over 2, then um, for any F belonging to HS, F is uh, actually C0, I mean, continuous. So if uh, S is large enough, uh, bigger than half of the dimension of the space, then uh, first of all, because it's positive, I can always think of it as inside L2 of Rn. So these are at least measurable L2 functions. But more than that, they are in fact continuous functions. Okay. So that's the first version of Sobolov level. I will uh, mention, uh, maybe even cool, a, a stronger version, but that's the uh, same. Idea. So let's prove this. Just uh, to give you a flavor of this proof, I'm not planning to prove everything because if you want to prove everything, this is just going to take to take a long time. I mean, we won't be able to uh, spend too much time on index theory properly. So let G belongs uh, to Lord's class. Then, um, of course, by Fourier inversion, I can write g of x, right, equal to e to integral e to the i x c g hat c uh, dx c, right. Now uh, here I can stick a factor of uh, one plus c squared to the power s over two and minus. This is equal to integral e to the i x c g i c times one plus c squared to the power s over two times one plus c squared the power uh, minus s over two dxc. Now we can use, uh, this is inner product of these two functions now, right? It's this function with this function taking inner product, okay? So the Cauchy-Schwarz tells us that by Cauchy-Schwarz, this is less than equal to um, well, I mean, I have to take uh, norm of this function times norm of this function, right? So uh, this is going to be the sort of norm, I believe. So let me just write it like this, integral over Rn, uh, g hat c. Uh, yes. Uh, one plus c squared, uh, maybe like that, actually, yes. The power s over two times integral over rn, uh, one plus two times c to the power two minus s over two. And there is a big c, of course, and this is big c. Now, remember there is this condition that S is bigger than N over two, right? S bigger than N over two. And this is exactly the condition that you need in order for this to be convergent. So I'm allowed, in fact, to use Cauchy-Schwarz. This implies that this factor, which is a constant, 
right? This vector is less than infinity. Okay. So you this you're using the sobel and norm, right? I'm using sobel of norm. Uh, I haven't done anything yet, but this is sobel of norm. No, but so you're using Cauchy charts for this with respect to sobel and norm. No, no, no. I'm just using a uh, usual Cauchy Schwarz uh, with respect to L2 norm. L2 norm? Yeah, okay. with respect to L2 norm. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So, because uh, the Sokol of norm was L2 norm after you Fourier transform and after you multiply by this, so I can do that. Okay, so uh, this is really, I have to, to be careful, I have to put absolute values here. This is absolute value. Absolute value, and then so what 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 happens is that absolute value of g of x is less than equal to. In fact, uh, this is norm s two of g, right? So of norm uh, s two um, of g times some constant, I believe, some finite constant from c. For any x belonging to one. That's what we did. Yeah. Okay. So what is S2? Uh, what is S2? Oh, actually, yes. Uh, this is S. And remember this G, uh, we're just assuming it belongs to uh, Schwarz class on our end, right? Okay, now we can finish the proof because uh, an element of uh, solar space is a limit of such things, right? By definition. So, Any F belonging to HS is a limit um, in S norm. Uh, so F is limit of GNs as n goes to infinity of GNs belonging to Schwarz class by definition. So uh, if you use this, you notice that uh, actually there's a uniform convergence now, right? So we get that F is, I mean, these functions are continuous and they are uniformly convergent because. They are norm convergent here, so they are uniformly convergent, pointwise, and in fact, uniformly convergent. So F is a uniform limit of continuous, in fact, the smooth functions. So F is C0. It's continuous. So that shows uh, that this is the case. So um, that's um, one version of Sobel of Lama. Any questions? Or? Um, I think where we use the Cauchy Schwartz inequality, shouldn't the um, integrands be squared? Because we have the L2 inner product of two functions. Oh, these are the square. Yes, yes. You mean here? Yeah. And then there's a square root throughout the whole thing. Um, yes, yes, yes. I should have, uh, exactly, I should have square root of this guy. Yeah. I think so, yes. That's Cauchy Schwartz. 
Okay, so we are good. Now I, I can write a, a kind of stronger version of sobola flamma that gives more insight into nature of this uh, <coughs> sobola functions, uh, sobola uh, function spaces. If you don't have any questions about this, you okay? Okay, so let me erase this then. So this is uh, a kind of stronger version. But it's the same proof again. Stronger version of solar flamma. Let S bigger than N over two plus K, where K uh, is an integer, is a, is a non-negative, is a positive integer. Uh, then, uh, for any F, belonging to Hs or n with that condition f belongs to ck so this is k times uh, differential function Okay. So this is k time. I mean, proof uh, goes uh, along the same line, uh, but uh, you're not just working with g. Now you're, you have to take g prime, g double prime, and so on. And because you have this uh, stronger thing, if you take derivatives, you are going to produce higher factors here, but uh, sorry, smaller factors here. But then you are allowed uh, to to. To, to put a different factor here. So the whole thing, the whole scheme works. What happens is that you show that your function, in fact, is uniform limit uh, in, uh, in uh, I mean, uniform, so it's convergent in, um, so the derivative and higher, and uh, all derivatives, so what, 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 so the idea of proof that we write it here, sorry. Uh, so a similar proof shows. What is that? F um, um, is equal to um, so the approximating sequence. Gn um, uh, actually convergent uh, uniformly with all its derivatives. up to order k. And you have this result from basic analysis that if you have a sequence of functions that's uh, uniformly convergent, the derivative is also uniformly convergent, second derivative also uniformly convergent. The limit is k times differentiable addition. So the same result that we had for c0, now you have it for uh, c1, c2, ck. So this works. Uh, this is a crucial condition. So now we have a better understanding, at least, of the solar functions as uh, in, in the positive uh, range. So these are, uh, as S grows, they become more and more differentiable. So in particular, then, if you have something in the intersection of all those HS for S bigger than zero, certainly these are all smooth functions. Not all the smooth functions, but these are all the smooth functions. Because still we must have some, some, some decay at infinity, but they are definitely smooth functions. 
follows his reform. Any questions or comments? So this super of lemma we should keep in mind. That's uh, that's very important. Um, a second important lemma is something called relic uh, or relic lemma or relic lemma. Actually, the German name. So let me raise and then. Now remember, uh, we said that uh, S1 less than S2 gives an embedding of Hilbert spaces H S2 uh, in H. So let me call N of it. So uh, this uh, uh, relics lemma basically says that this embedding is essentially compact. So it is a compact operator, essentially. So yeah, I will tell you, uh, relics says this. This is essentially in the sense that I want to make precise uh, a compact operator. So, so, so this is very strong statement. So remember uh, the definition of compact operators. Uh, maybe we act from Hilbert space to itself, but you can easily formulate from Hilbert space to another Hilbert space, right? That's uh, what we have. Uh, so while we had an equivalent definition that if you have a bounded sequence of functions, then there exists a subsequence which is convergent in L2. That was, that was one criteria for, for compactness. Right? And that's what we are going to show actually here. So uh, more precisely, this relic lemma is this. Uh, given the sequence of n uh, inside Hs2 such that these guys all have their support inside some compact set. Then there exists a subsequence Oh, uh, sequence of support and of course norm N uh, is two yes is less than N for all N. This is crucial. They are, they are, they are, they are in, in some, some, some unit ball or something like that, right? Uh, then there exists a subsequence of NK. Okay, so K. So, uh, it's convergent in HS1, actually. If you look at it there, it's convergent. That's, uh, So that's um, like some Arzula's colleague for <laughs> exactly the proof uh, exactly uses Arzula's colleague theorem and playing with this definition of sort of norm. It's not very difficult, but it's uh, I, I because it was mentioned, so I have an excuse not to prove it. <laughs> uh, I, I highly uh, recommend you go through the proof in one of the sources. A great source, of course, is Gilkey's 1975 small book. That's great. 
uh, I'm using that a lot actually. So uh, the, he, he, gives, uh, he gives all the proofs patiently in that book, but without overdoing it. So he just have, strikes a lot, right balance. It's a great book by Gilkey. Um, so let's uh, keep that in mind that one of these uh, things, uh, embeddings, natural embedding is compact. And if you go over manifolds, compact manifolds, then you, you don't have any support condition. Everything will work naturally for a manifold, compact manifold M, the S of space S2 into S, S1 is compact. And that's what's going to help us to prove that these operators are Fred Holman. Because you remember the relation between compact operators and Fred Holman. It says something is spread on if and only if it is uh, invertible modulo compact operators. So we construct an inverse modulo this. Okay, now we have to take another plunge into another sort of waters, which is to the differential operators. We need that uh, in order to. Any questions or comments? Okay. So uh, I think we can discuss uh, pseudo differential operators. So the idea of pseudo differential operators is that if you have a differential operator, if you want to invert it, the inverse of this operator is not going to be a differential operator, right? The inverse of a differential operator, I mean, whatever it means, whatever we mean by inverse is, well, for example, you have an operator like DDX, and what is the inverse of this? So it's some sort of integration, right? Or what is the inverse of Laplacian in R2, the operator that we started discussing there? It's not a differential operator. It's going to involve some sort of more sophisticated ideas. So the type of operators that will emerge, uh, they are defined in terms of the symbols first and Fourier transform. So let me, let me mention. So, um, um, so, uh, so for E equal to sum A alpha X, D alpha, absolute value of alpha less than equal to M, uh, differential operator of order M, So uh, to be safe, I'm going to assume that this A alpha is actually have, um, well, I mean, have some sort of compact support. There is some growth condition, okay, uh, of order M in R M. Uh, what, what we can write? We can write this differential operator um, using Fourier transform, uh, using Fourier transform. We know that P U of X of X is, is equal to integral e to the I X dot C uh, P of X and C that's U hat C You see where P little P I mean is just uh, equal to that. Uh, you know. So this is the full symbol of P. Now we are not working with leading symbol, we are working with full symbol. It's the full symbol. So this P, the full symbol, 
the function of course from R n to R n to C, this is a smooth, right? And uh, some um, other properties that makes this uh, formula um, I mean, so, um, okay, so what is this, uh, what is this telling us? Why, why, why is such a thing is correct, by the way? Uh, do you see why this formula is correct? So instead of differentiating this function and then multiply by this a alpha x, what we can do, we can Fourier transform, multiply by this symbol, and then do an inverse Fourier transform and we get the function. So it, 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 it looks strange, uh, but this is a consequence of the fact that if you want to differentiate a function, you can Fourier transform, multiply by like C to the power of alpha, and Fourier transform back, you get the function. And that's a summation of those formulas. So this formula is absolutely okay. But then to use uh, the formula, we need to use the full symbol. Of course, I mean, if you just drop other terms, you're not going to get the operator itself. So we, have, we need this. Okay, but now look, uh, in C, this function P is a polynomial nation, right? Uh, P of X and C is polynomial. in C. That's exactly the reason that we are dealing with differential operators, right? Because, of, uh, but this gives us a gateway to introduce operators that with a symbol that are not polynomial in C. For example, they can have inverse C powers and they would be like inverse of differential operators with the integration operators like this. So that's the whole idea, writing your operator like that in Fourier, and then you see that how you can, how you can uh, generalize this. So then uh, let me now uh, define a notion of symbol of order M. So actually I can take um, for any M belonging to R, a symbol, uh, of order n, um, p belonging to S m um, is a function p. I just write variables like uh, bad calculus students. Just say function of Rn plus Rn to C. P as uh, such that one P of X and C is uh, smooth in X and C. I mean, forget about everything else I did. I'm just defining a class of functions now in two variables. What's your oh, what is that? SM? Sorry? What is SM? SM? Oh, uh, this is the uh, notation for symbols of order M. It's the class of symbols of order M for me. I denote it by SM. Uh, if it has the following properties P of X and C is a smooth, or is C infinity in X and C. It has compact support in. Uh, C, second of all, as compact support in X. Okay, so second one. And um, there is a decay condition for any alpha beta that exists 
on constant uh, C algorithm such that absolute value of P alpha X, the X derivative, and then you do C derivative beta times of P of X and C. This is uh, less than or equal to P alpha beta value of one plus C I D is not one of scale times M minus so these are of course uh, multi indices. For any p, for p to be in SM, it has to satisfy these three properties. The third one says that for any multi indices alpha and beta should be just constant uh, C alpha beta such that this holds. So what does this say? This basically says that the dependence of at this p of x and c in c is morally morally uh, of order m in c because as you differentiate beta times you bring the kind of dependence on c uh, absolute value of beta times or for example here is an example simple example uh, for any p of x and C equal to sum A alpha X and C alpha absolute value of alpha less than or equal to M. So this time it's polynomial. But A alpha, I'm supposing we are supposing they have compact support, right? Uh, A alpha compact support. In order for this uh, to be true, um, P belongs to S. Of course, here, here m is an integer, it's a non negative integer, uh, but here um, m could be negative. Uh, uh, and it's very important to deal with negative powers because we want to invert things and so on. Clear? Now, um, exactly the same proof that we used. Um, um, okay, so let, let me just say this. Now, this P belonging to SM defines an operator capital P now. Okay, so there, there, there is a relation between the two. There is little P and capital P from Schwartz class functions. At least, or n to itself. Right? By the formula that I just erased, you go to Fourier, multiply by p and compact. By the formula, e u x equal to integral e to the i x dot c p of x and c, right? Uh, you had C X. So this uh, is well defined, defines the map from Schwarz functions to Schwarz functions. And now, uh, similar to differential operators, you can now show by the same argument essentially that this extends to a bounded linear map uh, into uh, Schwarz, into, into sort of uh, spaces. So let me just write it down. Well, maybe I didn't even say that. Maybe I, I haven't, uh, maybe I didn't say that. Uh, okay, maybe I went too fast, right. So, um, yeah, okay. So let me put it like this, then easy to see that. Um, P uh, has a unique extension to a continuous map um, uh, 
um, P from H S R N to H S minus N of R. I'm sorry, I, I don't think I mentioned this for differential operators before. I should have mentioned it because that's that's a crucial property. I went too fast. I don't think I mentioned this uh, in, in the first part of my lecture. I should have mentioned. This is uh, for differential operators and for um, super differential operators in this sense. Uh, this is not difficult. You just write down the formula for S minus M because uh, here you see to do this, you are multiplying by one plus C the power S over two, right? Here you are multiplying, you are measuring by multiplying by one plus C to the power uh, S uh, over two um, uh, minus M over two. But on the other hand, because there is a derivative involved here, M times derivative, so there is some C to the M appearing here. So this multiplied by that, uh, I should have something like C to the M. They compensate and we give you again S over two. So proof of this I'm saying is very easy. But do it please, that's fine. So that is a, um, of course, I mean, from the beginning, it was one of my reasons to introduce, one of our reasons to introduce this. Um, Sobolev uh, spaces. In, in Sobolev norm, differential operators become bounded operators, but you have to change the scale. Should I go in more detail into proof of this? Or? I think it's very clear from if you write down the definition. I see that uh, Luke is nodding, so that's good. Sorry, did you claim that this map was compact as well? No, 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 we are not saying this is compact. No, 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 not at all. I mean, uh, we are just saying it's a bounded linear map. Because one of the issues with uh, L2 norm was that differential operators were not bounded in L2 norm. But now we have found norms in, uh, under which differential operators are bounded from one inverse space into another inverse space. And that, this allows us to bring in abstract Fredholm operator techniques. All that Fredholm theory we de develop is going to be used here. For example, Atkinson's theorem is going to be used to prove that these differential operators essentially they have uh, um, they are they define Fred Hall if you go into this scale. So let me then um, okay. So because uh, because uh, Pranov asks, let me just mention how this. And then let me try. We'll soon show that. Soon means perhaps next lecture. Um, uh, with enough definitions uh, for any elliptic mm -hmm. elliptic differential operator P on C infinity of E to C infinity of F, uh, we get a unique extension. Again, I call it P from this uh, Sobolev space HS of uh, E to Sobolev space HS minus M of E for all S belonging to R, uh, so of order M. And furthermore, not only bounded like in this case, in fact, it's a fretron operator. And in fact, it's fretron. So that's one of the one of the pieces 
of uh, technology we need in order to get going. So we will prove this uh, because you know you have to spend a little bit of time developing these spaces, uh, sovereign spaces of vector bundles, sections of vector bundles. It's pretty similar, but there are some technicalities. Also, so the differential operators are more technicalities if you want to move over vector bundles. But these have been done a long time ago. We're just using this itself. Okay, so that's that. That's uh, that's uh, forthcoming, and um, sorry about that. I I should have mentioned that completely. I was uh, carried away by uh, some other arguments. So. Okay, so any comments or questions? Can I have one, 10 more minutes so that we just, uh, we just get to some, some good one. So some examples of now, of symbols are T of XC belonging to SM. Of, so, 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 so some symbols of order M, so some examples. Of course, as, as I mentioned, I mean, the first example, of course, is um, symbols of differential operators, right? Um, P of X C equal to some A of X C alpha absolute value of alpha less than equal to. As soon as we choose these A alphas with compact support, and uh, N in this case is an integer. But with this thing, we cannot produce anything above symbols of a positive integer order, right? So that's what it is. Uh, but then you can also construct things like that. Now you can invert, for example, you can take PXC equal to one plus absolute value of C. Um, so my notation is, yeah, two to the power M over two. Um, yes. Now, this is for any M. You can easily, any M in R, you can easily check that this is a symbol of order M. I mean, this P belongs to. This does not have complex support. Sorry? This does not have complex support. Oh, okay. That's a good point. I just multiply by some function A of X. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Good point. So you multiply by some compact support function, then you get something. Very good. And uh, what else? I, so that, that, that's it. I mean, for example, you can take a negative now. And in fact, the symbol of uh, inverse of Laplacian or um, pseudo inverse of Laplacian would be of this form, e.g. P of x. And C equal to uh, you know A of X over one plus absolute value of C squared. I mean this is of degree minus two. Right? It's a symbol of degree minus two. So you can construct uh, symbols of uh, any order you wish to. Do this sort of things. Okay, finally, what we want now, so so now um, so let's see how, how we how we are playing this game now. So what we are doing is this we have these symbols. Just to uh, confirm so this last condition for the central forces, it should be a sort of a polynomial. Uh, zeta, or can it be like transcendent zeta? Uh, polynomial mean uh, C. Oh, no, no, not at all. It I mean, transcendent. oh, no, no, yeah. I mean, you can have, for example, exponential of minus uh, norm of C squared. <laughs> so this would be in SN for all N, because it's rapid decay. So, yeah, I mean, the point is uh, we are not uh, uh, confined to working with just uh, integer symbols. I mean, it's important to allow all kinds of things. So the way that now we have been playing this game, 
uh, we are going to play even more is, is this. We have the symbols and we have operators, right? So we have the two concepts. So symbols gives us operators. Okay, so by symbols, I mean this little PXC, for example, belonging to M. This gives us this operator P. I mean, at first, this P goes from Shor's class to Shor's class. Right? But then you can also go from uh, solar of space to solar of space, right? HS or M. HS minus M. Rn, for example, for all uh, S. Now, uh, here is a very natural question to ask. If you go there, you can combine operators. You can compose two operators, because these are just uh, going from S of Rn to S of Rn. I can compose them. The question is, is the composition coming from something here or not? Okay, so P, so, and then there is also Q of XC goes to, I mean, by this recipe to Q, again from S of Rn. S of Rn. And the question is uh, so of DB, for example, uh, so this belongs to S uh, M prime. And the question is what about P composed Q? Is this a uh, operator of a symbol or not? Does it have a symbol also? Same with the adjoint in some sense. Does it exist? And uh, what is its symbol? These are uh, very natural questions. Uh, in order to get this algebra right, uh, because we are going to invert, we are going to solve some uh, infinite systems of linear equations eventually, right? In order to invert these operators. Uh, so we have to get the algebra of symbols right. So we are going to define a product on the left hand side that would correspond to the uh, this composition on the right hand side. That's that's the idea. Uh, in what sense the uh, composition here corresponds to a product of symbols? And to this end, uh, there are two formulas which are basically calculus formulas. Um, and you can, you can you can easily work them out. So let me write it down here. So here is an example. You can, you can consider uh, some operators, P for example, one over I, uh, well, because we need this compact support condition, P dx, F dx, I mean AX, P dx. And Q equal to uh, P of X. So these are the type of operators that come from quantum mechanics. This is uh, a kind of uh, position operator. It's multiplied by some function, of course. This is, uh, uh, sorry, this is momentum operator. This is position operator. <laughs> if it is X, it is position. I mean, but we take compact support because of the technicality. So now the question is what is P compose Q? So uh, yes, P compose Q. You can easily work out P compose with Q uh, of U. You know, I mean, you apply this to U and you apply P to this. That's very easy. You can write it down and this, this turns out to be equal to one over I, A, B, E, D, X. Plus uh, one over i, a b prime. Okay, what is it? This is a first order operator. This is a zero order operator. We 
decomposing them, multiply them, you get the first order operator again of this formula. This is the differential part, and this is the constant uh, zero of the point. So in general, then what you can show for uh, at least uh, for differential operators, we can easily prove the following. So this I recommend you to try to prove. Uh, so for differential operators, P equal to sigma AR for X, AR for Q equal to sum whatever, I mean, absolute value of alpha less than equal to m, absolute value of alpha less than equal to m prime, e alpha x, e alpha, of its symbols p and q, I mean, full symbols, p and q, you can, uh, remember, these are differential operators, right? So these are of this form. You can easily uh, prove that the uh, composition of these two things is a differential operator, and you can write down the formula for the symbol. Um, we have uh, PQ. So let me see if I have PQ, Q, Q. We have PQ uh, um, is a differential operator with symbol. Uh, so, a symbol of PQ equal to sum P e of uh, C, uh, symbol of P, uh, D of uh, X, symbol of Q, so uh, value of alpha. Less than equal to m plus b. This is the formula. So this is a generalization of this type of formulas. I mean, uh, in order to get, you just write down and uh, bring everything into a standard form by passing over the differential sign, differentiating, and you get this formula. This is a nice exercise. I mean, this is just uh, calculus. This is just calculus. Yes, when you compose polynomials, you get a polynomial. That's uh, also needed. Yeah, but basically, uh, you have to use uh, some sort of Leibniz rule. So. Yeah, yeah, no, but in terms of symbols, that just like you're composing the polynomial. You're plugging in one polynomial. Uh, there is differentiation also involved. Yes, there is the derivative. Yeah, but that, that's essential. Also, Uh, there exists operator P star, a differential operator again. So P star. So now here is a, is a nice thing. So P star, this is, if this is my operator P, formally at least you can see what the adjoint of this operator is going to be. The adjoint of this operator is going to be well, this D, the way we have written, is a, is a self-adjoint operator. And I mean, formally self-adjoint. And these are just uh, things. So, I mean, so it is really some absolute value of alpha less than equal to um, uh, Okay, so let me write it uh, like this. D alpha first. And then A alpha x complex conjugate. Uh, yes. Okay. So there exists an operator such that the following formula holds P, F, and G is equal to F. Star G. So for all F and G belonging to short uh, functions, now 
To prove this, I'm not saying this is a differential operator yet, because it's not clear in this form it's a differential operator. I'm just saying there exists an operator which is written like that, and it satisfies this condition. To prove this, all you need is integration by part formula, okay? So you just need integration by part. So, integration by part. Then the, the, the claim is that this is also a differential uh, operator, and I'm, I'm going to write the formula for the simple. Because it's not in the standard form, right? The uh, function is uh, in front of the differentiation. It's not in normal form. In the normal form, should be, this function should be here. But you can do it. You can write it that way. And the point of that is that now we get a formula like this for the simple. So we get, uh, and furthermore, so this needs really a proof, but it's not so a symbol of this star is going to be equal to some, uh, I believe it's going to be uh, D alpha C, and then D alpha X, symbol of P, complex conjugate, so you see that there are two statements. First of all, I just wrote down this formula like that. I'm saying this is just using the integration by part formula. That's not. But then I'm saying that the second step, this is indeed a differential operator. We can write it in the standard form with this symbol. If I give you this, you have to compute this. You know, there are a lot of terms here. Compute that. I recommend you do this for uh, examples of degree one, two, things like that. And then you see that again. This is not more than calculus. Yeah, I have a question here. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 This one? Composition number. Yes. Uh, above one. Oh, where? Here? Yeah. The composition symbol. Oh, here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, why do you get the sum from the product of, uh, to the product of n prime? Why is it to the sum of n prime? Product of n prime? No, no. It's, uh, it's a, the degree of two differential operators, if you multiply, it's the sum of the degrees. Yeah, but here we are not, here we composing. Composing is multiplication of differential operators. So we are just multiplying this differential operator. And when I discuss differential operator, you remember I said that it's a filtered algebra in the purely algebraic case. And uh, yeah, it's, the filtration is by this degree filtration or order filtration, of course. Okay, so I think uh, that's good. Uh, now, uh, should we stop then? I think it's a good time. So uh, I just stop the recording uh, and then we can discuss if you, or maybe if you have questions, maybe we wanna discuss it in front of camera if you want. Or what. Okay, so let me then stop the recording. Okay, pause, stop.